All right, good afternoon and welcome to the August 10th special meeting of HWMA. Um, I will start by taking roll. Meredith Matthews, that's me, I'm here. Um, Director Jones? Here. Director Castellano? Here. Director Katie? Here. Director Madrone is absent. And Director Wilson? Here. All right. So we will start with the consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine by the HWMA board and will be enacted upon by one motion unless a specific request for review is made by a board member or a member of the public. The consent calendar will not be read. There will be no separate discussions of these items unless pulled for discussions. So we have A, approved minutes from the June 8th 2023 HWMA Board of Directors meeting and B, approve proposed reorganization. I move approval of the consent calendar. I'll second. All right, we have Director Jones approve and Director Castellano is a second. All right, now it's time for oral and written communications. Are we gonna vote? To vote? Oh, sorry. Let's take a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks, you guys. Um, oral and written communications. Do we have any members of the public that wish to make a comment? Anyone on Zoom? All right. We'll move on to number four, which is to receive a presentation on Little Hoover Commission and SB 1383 report. Can we get a staff report, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so the little hoover commission uh, was modeled after the, the federal hoover commission which was created in 1947 as a bipartisan body with members appointed by congress and the president to make recommendations to improve the structure of the legislative and executive branches <laughs> California's commission, formed in 1962 as an independent and bipartisan state agency, was tasked with making recommendations to the state legislature and the governor on ways state programs can become more efficient and effective. The commission is made up of a total of 13 seats. Nine are public members and the remaining four are state legislators. The commission is required to be bipartisan by statute, with no more than five public appointed members being from the same political party, and no more than two of those state legislatures from the same party. <clears throat> the commission can gather study topics from a wide range of sources. Citizens can email um, topics for discussion. Legislators can also recommend topics to the commission. Uh, and touching back to why the commission was created, they're required to look at state programs. Once a topic is chosen, the commission begin, brings key stakeholders along with experts in their particular field to conduct interviews. Based on these preliminary meetings, the committee identifies key issues and holds public hearings. With the input from these hearings, the committee develops recommendations and issues reports. <clears throat> The commission's report on SB 1383 is just over 80 or 30 pages long with eight sections that touch on distinct parts of the legislation. The commission held three separate public hearings and developed 12 detailed recommendations. This board has heard me speak at length about 1383, so I'm not going to belabor every point in this uh, document, but I did want to touch on several key recommendations the commission made uh, within this document that I believe impacts Humboldt County directly. <clears throat> the commission's very first recommendation of the report is to place 1383 implementation on pause. They believe the 2023 to 2025 targets are unlikely to be met and cite a lack of processing capacity statewide as major hurdles for compliance. They note the jurisdictions are still playing catch up in complying with regulations and over 100 jurisdictions statewide have sought extensions. The commission outlined steps the state, sh the state should take during this time. These included rolling out education to residents and the importance of SB 1383's goals, develop a realistic financing plan based on cost analysis, work to expand market opportunities for recycled organic material, and improve coordination among state agencies. 
The next recommendation speaks to how 1383 regulations have the potential to disadvantage rural California. The commission believes that asking rural jurisdictions to comply with regulations designed for urban areas may pose hardships on those communities and the cost for complying may outweigh the benefit of doing so. Many rural areas lack the infrastructure or the financial means to implement the required programs in the given timeline. And while the commission acknowledged the limited waivers are available, they questioned their efficacy and noted that compliance means so much more than simply adding organic pickup to your current services. Additionally, they felt options for residents and businesses to sell fall should still be made available during this time period. <clears throat> The commission made their stance very clear on local community composters and their recommendation to the state is to support and edify local small compost solutions whenever possible. This is just carving out space in the collection ecosystem for community composters is appropriate and do not believe classifying them as haulers is beneficial to jurisdictions, small composters or the customers that they serve. Local composters are often met with either contractual or legal obstacles due to franchise contracts. The commission does not believe someone who picks up small amounts of organic waste has the intention nor the abilities to compete with large scale haulers. In concert with these changes, state and local jurisdictions should either consider tax or other financial incentives for those who participate in local composting programs. And to ensure these community compost operations can continue to exist, the state should ensure ample grant funding is available for these specialized activities. <clears throat> Edible food recovery is just one key aspect of 1383 compliance, but the commission feels those efforts may be better suited outside the current 1383 structure and recommends removing edible food recovery requirements entirely until more info can be gleaned about the activity. They cite not only the low percentage of potentially donatable food that is present in the state's current waste stream, but question whether this is the most effective use of time and taxpayer dollars at this juncture. They would like to see the state provide independent analysis to policymakers with detailed information across multiple sectors of the state. This is to ensure better decisions can be made and the process of recovery is not only beneficial to the state, but it's food needy residents as well. The last part of the report I'll touch on is not a singular recommendation, but an entire section of the report that touches on several areas that revolve around the cost of implementing SB 1383 programs. This section starts on page 24 of the report, and I would recommend all board members to read through this section when time allows. It touches on the shortfall of funds when comparing the estimated price tag for implementation to the original cost estimates given to the legislature when this was introduced. It calls out the exclusion of existing infrastructure when generating procurement targets and speaks to the unfunded procurement requirements along with a myriad of other financial concerns. In closing, if anyone is unable to set aside the time to read the entire report, I will leave you with a snippet of the document that I feel best summarizes it. It is a portion of a letter from Pedro Nava, who has served as the chair of the Little Hoover Commission for eight consecutive terms. He writes, the commission concluded that significant changes are needed if the state is to meet its target of reducing the amount of organic material going into landfills. We believe the state should reaffirm its goal while reconsidering its method. Changes in law are needed. Additional funding is required. Local jurisdictions must be given a realistic amount of time to develop infrastructure. The unique requirements of rural California must be considered. Perhaps most important of all, everyday Californians must be educated about the critical need for this change. No program of this magnitude succeeds without the public's buy-in and belief. <clears throat> And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, relating to the presentation. I open up for questions. Director Castellano. Um, two quick questions. The first is, you know, I was curious in terms of uh, tonnage of waste. You, how much tonnage of waste does Humboldt County produce just uh, annually? I know 200,000 tons was cited. Yeah, just right at around 100,000 tons, give or take. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's well under the, the 200,000 ton threshold. Okay. And then um, 
Have you been in touch with um, Senator McGuire or Assemblymember Wood in terms of what kind of impact this uh, report is having, you know, amongst mm -hmm. our electeds in Sacramento? So we have reached out to staff. I have not been. We have reached out to staff. I've not been directly in contact um, with either of them. Um, but the sense I'm getting from the South is rolling back some of the implementation requirements of this bill would be incredibly difficult. Um, that's not saying that some of the things that are in this uh, report aren't feasible, um, but overall, many jurisdictions inside the state of California have already begun to comply and have already spent an incredible amount of money to comply. Um, I think right now they're wrestling with what it looks like to roll those requirements back and deal with the outfall or the blowback from jurisdictions who have already spent time and money to come into compliance. Now, with that said, I think based off of the amount of waivers, right around 100 um, for the entire state, each county, so 100 counties in this state, um, I think some of the things that are suggested in the Little Hoover Commission report could be implemented. I think it would be wise, at least in my my own opinion. I think it'd be beneficial not only to rural California, but California as a whole to ensure that some of these requirements um, are cost effective now in, in today's today's world. Um, but outside of the general of their they've received the port and they're looking at it. No, we haven't had any anything else from from either of their their staff. Thank you. Yeah, so have we have we spent money as HWMA, uh, when we because we, we closed down the recycling center and we were going to do work on the doors and the floor, have we already spent that money? Uh, so we have not spent the actual infrastructure money. So the six hundred thousand for the floors, the additional four to five hundred thousand for the doors, scales, um, striping, stuff like that. No, we have not spent that physical amount of money. Um, but tackling SB 1383, the amount of sheer staff time that we've spent on going through the legislation, working with jurisdiction staff, working with haulers, everyone may not have cut a large check on a single day for the implementation of this. But that's not to say that every single jurisdiction in this room, including HWMA, hasn't spent a significant amount of staff time and money um, looking towards working to implement these these requirements. And that that quantifying that amount, it would be near impossible. We've HWMA has been working on 1383 since it came out in 2016. Jurisdictions have been working on this for the better part of two years. Um, and it's a full-time job for some of these individuals. The county has created a new position specifically for some of their waste reduction activities with edible food recovery and 1383 requirements being a main driver of that job creation. So no, the no jurisdiction, HWMA has not wrote a massive check to solve 1383 problems, but we have been spending money over the years to work towards compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, but and then you say you don't really have a feel for what, whether it's Cal Recycle. Who I mean, in the end of the day, who has the final say? The state legislature or Cal Recycle? That's probably a question I can't answer. I don't know um, specifically. Generally, what happens is the legislature develops a bill and passes it, and then they pass that legislature on to Cal Recycle. And Cal Recycle is the body that goes through the process of rulemaking. They get interested stakeholders. They hold public meetings to start developing um, the compliance language and verbiage of the legislature. They basically tailor their, their requirements to ensure the legislature is met at, at some point. Um, so Cal Recycle is more of the rulemaking body, but the rules themselves were originally made by the legislature. So I, I don't know what it would take 
um, to alter all of the requirements. I know that some of these changes in, in here absolutely would, would require either amending or changing 1383, just because of some of the, the mandates in the legislature itself. The, um, and, I, and I've expressed it before, but I just, it just doesn't seem that it's, it is realistic to make this thing work, which the state wants us to do. Um, and, and I guess at the end of the day, what's that going to do to the local jurisdictions? I mean, Riddell has a, a waiver for four years, probably four years now. It was five, but probably we're probably down in the four years or less. What's that going to mean in the end of the day for us? I, I can't tell you. Um, so as just as a reminder, the waivers don't waive you from all requirements of 1383. They just waive you of certain ones, procurement being the main one. Um, but that it's not a it's not a magic slip of paper that means you don't have to work towards compliance or you don't have to worry about compliance for four years. It's more of giving smaller jurisdictions the time to develop bandwidth to deal with with these requirements where larger jurisdictions they've had since 2016 so the state does not feel that they need or warrant maybe some of those waivers um what i would say is your your jurisdictions are not different than a lot of the state i mean there's over a hundred jurisdictions who have waivers on file right now um but as far as what that means for your jurisdictions as a whole that that's well outside of of my ability to to comment on um yeah. okay um first of all i want to thank you for this report and it's too bad that uh, steve madrone isn't here this evening because he was i think one of the people that brought this to our attention at one of our last meetings um so having said that uh, along with the report was an Appendix A, a letter from Jose Atilio Hernandez, a commission member, um, outlining some reasons why he feels that apparently his jurisdiction should be exempt from certain areas. And I was wondering if that was attached with the possibility that we might be uh, crafting a letter of similar to this, or um, is there a way to, to start something um, like a similar letter outlining our our feelings about this um so yeah so that letter is actually drafted um it's it's what's called the minority opinion um so generally when little hoover commissions or larger commissions like this take on a subject like this and release a report if they're if it's not unanimous or if not every single commission member agrees with all recommendations there's what's called a minority um report that so jose um jose hernandez is actually a commission member on the little hoover commission and that that letter represents like the minor the minority report of it so he um it gives him the opportunity to disagree with some recommendations that are in the commission's document itself. Does that make sense? So yeah, the, the public comment period for this happened um, late last year in 2022. Um, and the, the three public meetings have already happened. And so then this final report is released. Um, and so that's just a, com a member on the actual commission's minority letter. Thank you for yeah. the clarification. Thank you. Yeah, I read this whole thing. I'm like, oh my gosh, this, <laughs> this is a dream. Like, it's, you know, it really is everything that Humboldt County is. And, you know, I felt it really speaking to Arcata with neighborhood composting and, you know, things that we already do as a city. And um, I, I just feel like it kind of gave me a little bit of <laughs> false hope. <laughs> so, um, what do you, I mean, what are the next steps that we can do with this? Anything? So if you'd like, I can look at either drafting a letter of support of the Little Hoover's com recommendations and get you some names that we can send it to. If that's something that you'd like, um, we can do that. Um, I'd be more than happy to draft a letter in support of 
whatever recommendations um, you'd like. If there's certain ones in there, um, I can work with uh, chair if you like, or we can bring this back at a, at a later date and we can specify exactly what recommendations and what you guys would like to throw your support behind. I've been more than happy to do that. But as far as anything else, my recommendation to the jurisdictions would be to continue as you have before you read this report. Um, this report is solely recommendations to the governor and the state legislature. Um, and until we hear different or we see forward movement, I would recommend continuing to move forward um, in SB 1383 implementation. Would it help if um, our cities drafted letters as well? <clears throat> I, yeah, I think I, I don't I don't think that would be an issue. I think that would be perf that would be perfectly fine. I think if being frank, I I wish this commission had come out with this report two to three years ago. I realized some of the recommendations in there they wouldn't be able to make. Um, but a lot of the recommend recommendations were issues stakeholders had in 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, when they were doing the rulemaking and the legislative process. Um, this is my own op opinion, but it's going to be incredibly difficult to roll back some of these mandates that they've already made jurisdictions comply with. And that that's I'm not saying it can't happen for smaller jurisdictions because it, it definitely there's a better shot for some of the recommendations in here that apply to very small jurisdictions, which in the grand scheme, all of Humboldt County is. Um, so I don't want to crush complete hope, but their recommendation one of completely pausing 1383 implementation. I would be incredibly surprised if they move forward with that. We could still like they could still cherry pick some yeah, smaller things that and they generally the legislature generally does so it's very rare that um the little hoover commission puts out a report and every single recommendation is moved forward that that just doesn't happen um but they have picked recommendations that they move forward or consider and then the legislature alters um and puts their own interpretation and things like that on it so it's not it's not unheard of um, by any means. So yeah, we definitely could, uh, I could either bring back a report on each single recommendation and we could go through them in open session to figure out exactly which recommendations you'd like to support that we can draft. Uh, if the board's comfortable, I can work directly with the chair or the vice chair to figure out exactly what direction we want to go and then bring the letter back, uh, before the board for, for everybody's, um, take on it that those are both options that we can do. Yeah, I'm happy to work on that with you. Um, Director Castellano, did you have another question? I have some comments, so I can wait till pu after public comment if uh, that's more appropriate. Sure. Do we have any public comment? Don't all jump up at once. Yeah, on Zoom. Anyone online? Yes, Devin Edgar. Go ahead. Go ahead, Evan. Yeah. Evan Edgar, Edgar Associates, thanks for um, allowing me to comment. Eric, that was a great analysis and report you made. You kind of spot on on all issues coming out of Sacramento. The only thing I want to add is that the cherry picking a different um, pausing for rurals, I would work with um, RCRC, the Regional Council of Rural Counties. Um, John Kennedy is, is your lobbyist, and RCRC is already forming a group of rural um, counties to go through that commission report and pick and choose exactly what you talked about and what, what they would do they find a um, author of a bill next year sponsor legislation rcrc would sponsor it to kind of roll back and cherry pick portions of that coover commission report exclusive to the rural counties um eric is right a lot of people spend a lot of money in the urban sector to implement 1383 and that train has left the station so the urban sector is moving forward um, regardless of the report um, um, but from the rural county point of view, there are there is some movement there from RCRC to implement some of the things you're talking about. So um, Eric's report was spot on. Thank you for that. That was good information. Um, I see Linda has her hand raised. Yeah, uh, Linda Wise. Um, I, I just thought it would be worth saying is that you know even with you know mentioning about the Little Hoover Commission report, but 
I think, you know, we could all be forward thinking about whether or not this happens or, or not. Um, one of the things that we're finding with organics processing facilities throughout the, the state is the issues around uh, contamination. And that's really around uh, the importance in doing education to the users of any system, whether it's organics or recycling. Right now with Humboldt County, you know, we've been ringing the bell for quite a while with our issues around the contamination um, of the recycling. Um, and some of these uh, organics facilities will stop accepting organic waste from uh, jurisdictions if, they're, if they don't reach benchmarks. And I think that's certainly it's something that we, I'm hoping the jurisdictions um, hold as a, as a really high priority with discussing what parts of this that we want to um, really focus on. I think that's something that we need to, to work on a, quite a bit now. Also, I um, may not know is this farmland is 23% more contaminated with microplastics than the ocean. So that's going to become even more and more important um, as we're looking at the, the origins of those things and it's um, uh, organics uh, composting is, is going to be something that's going to be a port, point source communication. So as soon as we can get on the wagon about waste reduction and uh, with um, reducing contamination in our waste streams, the better. Um, it's going to make things um, easier to implement things in the future. Um, so that, that's my, my bandwagon for tonight on that, but um, I just wanted to make that, uh, put that out there. Um, that's just very important. Oh, and I just wanted to also say with regard to, you know, the, the composters, the community composters, I think all that is, is, is welcome within a system, particularly in the eyes of a um, franchise collection. I think the, the one concern that, you know, that we do have with that is you just want to make sure that these, these facilities have stability um, and that there's a plan if, if, if it doesn't work out. Because in our franchise agreements, um, they're, they're, right now they're being fashioned so that the franchise um, holders are responsible for ensuring diversion for our communities. Really want something, you know, to, to be able to, to, to look for um, ensuring stability of the community composters. Um, it's not that there's there's not a place for inclusion in that. That's all I gotta say. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, I see one more hand raised, just a phone number. Do you wanna unmute yourself? Yeah, hi, this is uh, Director Madrone. Sorry, I've been trying to get into Zoom for about a half hour, but I've been here for the last 10 minutes. Um, so I just wanna let you know I'm here, but in this role, <laughs> thanks. And I guess I'm doing uh, Zoom remote. I don't know if it's needed for a quorum tonight. Do you have a quorum already? We should do. Okay, so then I'll just participate as a listener and not worry about my voting privileges so that I can still save those for that two that you get per year. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you here. I'm glad you're listening in. Um, any more public comments? All right, Director Castellano, do you have some more comments? Sure. Um, yeah, and thank you for the report. And, you know, I, I do generally think that it's wise to keep moving forward with the plans that we've been working on for some time. Um, though I, I would love to see rural communities working more together to kind of advocate for at least maybe a couple of options. You know, also being mindful that, you know, flow control, is, you know, may be necessary too, for, you know, in or to, to what degree flow control may be necessary for the long-term sustainability of things like composting in less populated areas. So, you know, I, I do think that, you know, some of the ideas around community composting or at least um, just, you know, maybe loosening some of the restrictions to composting in rural areas could be really useful so that I would love to see us not hauling waste outside of the county. That would be my dream in terms of, well, maybe not my dream, but you know, my, my wish in terms of, um, you know, long-term sustainability of these kinds of plans. Yeah, thank you for that. that so, um, Director Castellano, so flow can, HWMA's flow control of organic waste doesn't necessitate every single ton coming through our doors. 
Um, so the fact that HWMA has flow control of organics now does not mean that community composters will be boxed out of their opportunities. Um, we will work with jurisdictions and we will work with haulers and we will work with community composters to ensure that those operations continue. Um, it would be very similar to what we do with the satellite facilities for solid waste. So Eel River, um, Recology, and Humboldt Sanitation, they accept and collect member agency material. It doesn't come to the Hawthorne Street Transfer Station. We have agreements with them uh, to ensure that flow control is still maintained, you still get the benefit of your contract being on a part of the authority. Um, but it, flow control does not mean every ton has to come to us. So these, these types of community compost facilities can still operate as long as the jurisdictions, the franchise haulers, and HWMA work together to, to make that happen. Thanks for that clarification. Um, so... Um, you talked about community composters. What about like neighborhood composters, like just people that compost their own things? Is that included or? So self hauling is outside of flow control. HWMA's flow control doesn't kick in until it's collected by a, a franchised hauler. I'll say franchise hauler just to make it easier. But if an individual self hauls material to a community composter, that's outside of our um, flow control. If an individual backyard compost, that's outside of our flow control. Our flow control triggers the moment services that a jurisdiction with that is a part of HWMA provides that service and it gets either picked up by um, franchise haulers or, or some other individual that's contracted to haul this material um, as part of the jurisdiction services. Excellent. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? I, I just want to say um, that I agree with Leslie that we should be moving forward, um, Director Castellano. Um, but I don't know, being a little rebel, and I know it should be, it should have been done sooner, um, but now it's here now. I I would be very interested in fashioning some sort of letter um, that would express. Um, some of our reservations concerning particular items, especially the exempt for the rural areas and keeping waste local. I think that you're right that taking a pause is too late for that, um, but I think that would be good. And then, of course, the cost, which we wouldn't have known until we're well into it. You know, this isn't going on since 2016, but you wouldn't know that. You have to give it some time. So um, i just like to say that I would be in favor of uh, crafting a letter and signing it, um, I don't think it would hurt. <laughs> I may not help, but I don't think it would hurt. So, um, Director Keller Heckman, does that mean that do we need to re agendize this so we can make a motion to draft a letter, or can we do that now? No, you don't need to make a motion to draft a letter. You can just direction. I stab direct staff, and we can we can draft a letter if the board would like. They can discuss. Um, if they want me to bring it back as a discussion topic or if I can work with the chair to draft the draft letter and then have it come back for approval from the full board, um, stuff like that. Is everybody okay with that? If I work with, okay. okay. Yeah. And so then we'll draft the, we'll draft that letter and we'll bring it back. We'll re-agendize the actual draft letter and bring it back before the board. So, so you can vote and make edits as appropriate. Great, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. I was happy to hear it. All right. Um, I think Director Madrone has his hand up as well. Is he can? I mean, if he's just observing and we've closed public comment, it's fair. I just want to know, like, can we still have? No, him? you're right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. All right. So I guess we will move on to um, standing items, which is board member reports. Anybody have anything to report? So Blue Lake had another uh, yard waste day last Saturday, and again, it was very successful. So um, we'll continue to do that. Our next one is September 9th for citizens of Blue Lake. Anyone else? 
All right, Director Keller Heckman, do we have any executive director report? Uh, yeah, uh, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Hillary Schwartz. She is our new director of finance. Um, so you'll be seeing her um, at the meetings as well. And we'll be working closely to completely overhaul um, a lot of our financial practices, tighten them up. Um, she'll be working on the budget as well. Um, the audit will be incoming as well. So we're more than pleased to have her, to have her on staff. Um, additionally, uh, recruitment for the director of operations um, will be underway this Monday. Uh, so if you know of anyone, if your jurisdictions um, know of anybody, I would be more than happy to get you the information for applications as well. We'll be putting it out um, pretty wide. Um, additionally, uh, touching on carpet recycling. So HWMA um, is the second largest as of this, this week. Uh, collector of rural area recycling carpet. So up to date in 2023, we have collected 34,000 tons of carpet uh, for recycling. And that ends the executive director's report. Wow. All right. Well, if there is nothing else, welcome. It's wonderful to have you. Really looking forward to seeing what you do in the position and seeing a budget. And with that, I am going to go ahead and adjourn. Thank you.